Welcome um, everybody uh, back to Siegel Talks here on HowlRound and uh, so great of you to uh, listen back in. So wonderful of HowlRound to um, host us again. It's been uh, quite a journey so far um, after a break in uh, August and a bit in uh, September, we are back now. Uh, with our Siegel Talks. We will do three of them uh, in the week, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Um, for those of you who were able to listen in to our earlier Siegel Talks, they were quite, uh, quite astonishing. Uh, we all learned so much uh, listening um, to artists and uh, to how they experience this time of Corona. And um, they are, as we do know, so close to the moment, experience in the moment, but also anticipating the future and uh, and they have been on the right side uh, of uh, the, the history of progressive justice and, and of social issues. So uh, since times are changing, things already have changed. Um, it is uh, uh, important to listen to them. Now in Siegel Talks, we will focus uh, um, also uh, on the political of our work. We uh, will uh, talk to producers, curators, thinkers, philosophers, uh, uh, academics about uh, their work. We will also talk about the Siegel's plan for a 2022 citywide festival, the New York International Festival of the Art, the one Martin Siegel once um, created, and the work leading up to it in all New York City parks. And we will slowly uh, get there and learn from our participants final what will be um, the very best we can do. Again, thank you for tuning in and for listening. And again, HowlRound, it's a, a great, great honor to be to be uh, on the program and, and uh, I uh, learned uh, so much. And uh, we spoke to uh, over 150 artists in 90 sessions. They were from almost 50 countries, um, between 50 and 100,000 people listened um, to the talks. We were stunned uh, by the reactions. And, um, and it is uh, 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 also a sign uh, of, of, of a changing landscape and we have to find out and we have to, really listen and uh, to, to, to monitor the scene. With us today, we have an extraordinary, um, uh, how would one say, uh, a worker in the vineyard of the theater, also someone who is a, of Kaska would say, the Landvermesser, someone who surveys uh, the, the field and uh, puts it together. As my uh, friend, I'm honored to say, my colleague, Marvin Carlson, the Sydney Econ, a distinguished professor of theater, Comparative Literature and Middle Eastern Studies. He has taught uh, theater at the Graduate Center CUNY for a very long time. Together we created the Arab Stages uh, Journal, the online for over three decades. He has created the uh, European Stages uh, 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 Journal also online uh, at the Siegel Theater and his research interests include traumatic theory and Western Europe and theater history and traumatic literature, especially 1819 and 20th century. And uh, he is uh, best known for his books, uh, Theories of the Theater at Cornell, The Haunted Stage at uh, Michigan Press, Hamlet's uh, Shed of Mirror, Theater and the Real, and the latest one, um, 10,000 Nights. And I think uh, uh, I even have a copy here for 50 years, uh, Marvin um, went uh, obsessively to the theater for over 10,000 plays. He holds the world record most probably. Uh, the Guinness Book uh, record, if there would be an entry, and um, and uh, so of course uh, we are uh, interested to know what is on Marvin's mind. How is he experiencing this time? What does he think about uh, theater and performance um, at the moment? And uh, even so, I say this is about listening and radical listening. Now I talked uh, so very much. First of all, Marvin, um, welcome to Siegel Talks. I'm very nervous to be starting again, so it's great to have you with us. Where are you now? I'm uh, in the uh, den of my uh, lovely Victorian home in, in Ithaca, New York. Uh, I started out my profession teaching at Cornell and uh, I, I was there almost as long as I've been at CUNY, but not, not quite. Uh, I, I was here for 20 years. Um, during that time, my wife and I bought a lovely Victorian home, which has been our our second home, our summer home ever since. Um, and when uh, CUNY closed down, uh, 
obviously the thing that for me to do was to come up here and join my wife and my dog uh, in Ithaca. So I've been here uh, ever since. That's where I am. Yeah, yeah, I know your, your New York residence is just across from the Graduate Center. So you can make it in under 60 seconds from your apartment to your desk, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, um, quite something. So Marvin, um, how is that time for you? How, how, how are you experiencing this? Well, it's it's a it's a difficult time. Um, I think it is for everybody. The the uh, uh, and I don't want to claim any any special agonies, but I do think that uh, uh, professionally and socially, theater people surely suffer as well as much as anybody. We may be uh, as 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 I am certainly better off many people than many people are health wise or uh, financially economically uh, and of, for which I'm, of course I'm very grateful being able to retreat to a lovely home like this there are many wonderful things but in terms of intellectual cultural social uh, emotional life it's hard and and I think I as I I would claim a kind of special problem for theater people because professionally we're so closely tied to the living presence that not being able to go to the theater at all not being able to to, to uh, meet with people and talk about the theater not being able to in fact do what our lives are are based around um, is very hard uh, and by saying our lives are based around that I I have been an actor and director but I'm primarily a theater goer but as you say Frank I'm a uh, obsessive I think the word you use and I think it's a good you good word I'm obsessive about theater when uh all of my adult life, um, I have gone to the theater at least three or four times a week. Um, I, I count, counted up a number of years ago and I, I have averaged over the years about 250 plays a year. So that is several thousand. Um, and the, uh, of course, when all that stops, uh, it is as traumatic for me I, as, as, as I'm sure it is, though maybe not financially so much, thank goodness, as for the actors, the people who do this, what do they do now? Um, and so uh, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, the first several weeks, I think I was just simply wandering around thinking, what do I do now? Um, the, uh, uh, there's an, there's an, uh, a story, a New England story about the uh, the guy who lives in an isolated uh, uh, home in Maine, and really about the only connection he has with the outside world is that uh, every every hour the a foghorn goes off in the neighborhood, and one night it breaks down, and there's no sound at all, and he says, "What was that?" Mm -hmm. I feel that way about the theater. What? What is that? What's? There's nothing going on, um, and that that was very hard. I, I think my my first big personal project was to figure out how to how to structure a life without theater, um, and uh, uh, my solution was um, to structure my day as well as I could so that I had other things that that gave the day a kind of a shape. I, uh, I think the two most, most important, um, well, I did, I, you, you wonder, did I, did I watch Zoom and so on? Yes, although I find Zoom troubling. Um, it, uh, uh, there's wonderful work going on on Zoom, but every time I watch it, I think what it's not. Uh, and that, so I have a kind of a, um, a troubled relationship to Zoom, although I, of course, I do watch it. Frankly, I, I enjoy more watching old movies. Um, they are what they are, and they're, and they're not a kind of a substitute for something else. Um, but I have two big intellectual projects. I, I, I have wanted for a number of years to study Chinese, and so I 
my first couple of hours each morning are working on Chinese, which I feel uh, good about. Uh, it, it, and there's no danger of running out of material or time on that. And then the other major intellectual thing you've already referred to, and that is uh, uh, I, I, uh, my most recent, well, not my most recent book, but a recent book is, is a kind of theater going autobiography, The, the 10,000 Nights, which I, uh, uh, I, where I go back and write a short essay about the experience of going to the theater each year uh, over a 50 year period from 1960 to 2010. Um, when I finished the book, which I loved writing, loved thinking about and working on, much as I loved it, it really never occurred to me that at some time in the future, I might want to add to it. It seemed to me it kind of formed a unit of 50 years. Um, there didn't seem, I mean, obviously interesting stuff went on, but it, there didn't seem to be any particular reason to extend that. However, sitting around thinking, what am I going to do now with my free time? The thought then not surprisingly came back to me, especially since, well, it's been exactly 10 years since I did, since I, uh, did that 50 year survey. So um, uh, there would, was a kind of logic in saying, why not add another decade? The book is divided into, into decades anyway, a decade 2010 to 2020, uh, and make, it, uh, make the book the, the 60 years of theater before the plague. Uh, and that's been my major intellectual project to, uh, over the last several months, uh, going back, choosing again, as I did the first one play from each year, and writing about what that play meant to me and to the, the theater culture of the time. So those are the two big things that I've used to occupy myself. I do a little gardening which gets me outdoors, a little bit of hiking, which is easier to do upstate. Uh, those, uh, that, that's sort of been the main focus of my work. Yeah, that's, um, that's uh, so, so uh, very uh, impressive. And what do you think? I mean, of course it's a change, but what do you think from looking at the field of theater for five decades uh, now, uh, six decades. Um, what will be different? What do you think will well, happen to theater? Um, the hardest thing in the world is to predict the future. And I think particularly now, everybody is trying to think, uh, I'm, uh, people are generally agreed. Whatever we end up with after the after this session, it's not. We're not going to return to normal. Uh, you never do that anyway. Things move ahead. Things change. Um, the theater, as much as anything, uh, the uh, uh, even if even the same play, uh, we in theater, you and I and others that are theater aficionados, know this. Uh, perhaps better than anybody that when you do Hamlet in the 60s, it's not the same as when you do Hamlet in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. It, a play means different things then. Uh, and so I think in theater, we're particularly aware that, that, uh, that the art changes and the way you think about the elements of the art change, but in quite unpredictable ways. Uh, the, the, and so uh, I would, I would, I feel like Benjamin's angel of history. I can look back on the wreckage of the past, but I have no, my back is toward the future, not not because I want it that way, because that's the way we're built. And so, I'm I'm uh, I guess what I would the the only thing that I would say with 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 as much assurance as I have of anything is that what I consider to be the essence of theater, really, and which what we've given up is the, the living presence the, or the living co-presence of the audience and the actor. Uh, that is something that, uh, that 
we've had in this art from the beginning and all around the, all around the globe. Um, it's what we've lost now, largely. I, but that will come back. The particular way that it will come back and, and the kind of versions uh, that it will have. I've talked to some people who have said, well, this is now proven that we can get along without living theater. We will, the theater of the future will be something that is more sophisticated and elaborate than Zoom, but it will be essentially digital. The living body as we know it is as now sort of, we, we, we move, we're moving beyond that. I couldn't disagree more. I think as long as we are human beings, uh, the one thing I'd be sure of is we will continue to entertain each other by telling stories and we will do it in the physical presence of each other. I think those are absolutely essential. Now, what, what form that may take, um, one, one of the, uh, as I've looked at the 60s, um, as I've looked at the, uh, the 20, 2010s, the teens, whatever you call them, as opposed to the previous five decades, I think the most obvious change, particularly in the United States theater, but I, but but in in the Western theater in general, has been the greater involvement of the audience, uh, immersive theater, um, uh, all kinds of interactive material, uh, and that that's that's moved to a central position in the last decade that it never had before. Um, so here is a, a really quite unexpected elaboration uh, of the theater, and I'm sure we'll see other quite unexpected elaborations, but even, or maybe especially the immersive interactive theater, if anything, is a kind of extreme manifestation of what I talked about before, and that is the, the co-presence in the same space and time of the performer and the audience. If anything, immersive theater is a more extreme form of that. Um, uh, I think once once again you could say, well, all theater in a sense has suffered from uh, its virtual extinction during the during the COVID uh, epidemic. But uh, if anything, immersive theater even more so because everything about immersive theater is challenged by not allowing people to get together. Mm. Now, I never did, I really have never gone back actually to answer your question of what do I see about looking over? Well, I have to an extent, and that is that, that the theater is constantly changing and adapting uh, to the surrounding social and cultural uh, years. During the 60s, the theater uh, everywhere, or certainly throughout the West, but to, but to a, a significant extent in Japan and other places as well, very politically oriented, very much oriented toward that. Uh, uh, so the things that are now going on or that are going on in different uh, uh, in different periods uh, uh, in the in the seventies and eighties, when the society was very much concerned with with identity, with the rise of feminism, with the rise of the of, of black theater uh, and other ethnicities following gay and lesbian theater. Uh, all of those obviously reflected uh, what was going on in the society as well and made the, that the decade of the 70s in particular, to, to some extent the 80s, uh, have a different flavor and, and, and experiment in different ways with material. And that will obviously continue to be the case. The theater is very closely tied and always has been to the things that are that are occupying the culture itself, um, but once again, that's hard to hard to anticipate. Once you've made the general principle, would you say, well, we, we can assume that the theater is going to be tied closely to, to, to its culture, as it always has been. But since we have no idea how that culture will develop, or what the concerns or problems or challenges of that will be, then it's very difficult in any with any specificity to think what's the theater going to do since they're so closely tied yeah yeah it's a quite a 
an unusual situation we really don't know. I mean, already in life, uh, we somehow know we don't know, but now we really don't know that's uh, um, what will happen. And, um, and uh, the big, big changes also till the end of the year, you know, there's no vaccination. Uh, the, the, I spoke with Melanie Joseph this morning, you know, she said, what will happen? Oh, if the unemployment help runs out by December for all the actors and musicians and people who work in this on in and for the theater um uh, millions two millions uh, so it's a it's a quite a, quite quite a challenging and still um if it, there ever is a time where art and theater has something to say it should be now well exactly and and the uh, the problem is worse in many ways, the particular problem we're talking about in the United States than anywhere else. And that's because uh, the uh, our major theater is a commercial theater. And it is both, it, it, it surely is the worst possible combination economically. That is, the theater is dependent on uh, on its 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 economic success, I'm talking about the major theater, the Broadway theater. Uh, it, things because things get somewhat different when you get into smaller venues. Uh, but the 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 main theater, uh, when uh, uh, when the theater is both finance. Well, theater, theater is expensive anyway. No matter what where you do it and what culture, um, it. Uh, uh, it costs something to run it. There's two. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of material goods and so on. Um, but that is combined in the United States with a with a long tradition of the state not supporting the theater as it does in Europe. And so even now, as we speak, if I were in London or Paris or Berlin, I could go to the theater. Theaters are open. The big theaters, the main theaters in the country, the national. Well, at, literally at this moment, I don't think I'm not sure the national opens. It opens this within the next within this week. Um, the as you know, the Berliner Ensemble and and uh, the Deutsches Theater have already been open for 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 more than a week. Uh, the Theater de la Vie in Paris uh, opens this week. Um, it, this is a, this would be the equivalent of the of big Broadway houses or Lincoln Center or the Brooklyn Academy opening. Are they even thinking about opening? Of course not, because um, the way that all these theaters are opening, and this is perhaps a temporary measure, who knows? The way these are all opening, as you know, is by remodeling the theater so that you could have social distancing even within a major theater, the Olivier uh, in London, the, uh, uh, the, the, the major stage of the National Theater is reopening with a one-man show and with the seating reduced by two-thirds. There's only one-third of the seats left. And they've taken out all the rest as they did at the, at the Berliner Ensemble. Well, if you're if you're running the Brooklyn Academy or you're running the Majestic Theater in, in on Broadway, and somebody comes to you and says, "We can reopen the theater, just take out two thirds of the seats." Well, who's going to pay for this? And the answer is nobody, and therefore it won't happen. So uh, the well, it, I mean, it could happen if let's say you decided, all right, we're going to reopen Hamilton. But it's now going to cost three thousand dollars a seat. You could do it that way. Uh, that's not very likely to happen, uh, though. I guess anything is possible. Uh, and of course, that would mean only having, let's say, three or four hundred seats in the house. Take all the rest of them out. Uh, That—that's what—that's the 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 present solution now. Uh, it may be that indeed looking on into the future that uh, theater spaces will be conceived in a different way that, that we will socially distance in our theaters. I rather think not. I, I, I think that uh, there is something not just about 
an audience and and their their feeling their their feeling of being a crowd a group uh it's like a political rally or a, or a sporting match. The, the crowd, the crowd's feeling as a crowd is a very important part of the experience. Anybody who's ever uh, done a comedy in a theater with a sparse audience, even they, they may laugh enthusiastically, but it doesn't work. You've got to have a big audience. Uh, we see that with, uh, 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 with uh, the late night comedians like, uh, like Trevor Noel or Stephen Colbert, who are now doing one person things in their office or their home. And they were terrible the first week or so. And they knew they were. And they said, it's, I don't know how to do this without people laughing and, and responding. Um, so uh, I think that um, uh, I think this this dispersed audience is not going to last. I think there will, I don't think we'll necessarily go back to the sardine packing Broadway model of theater. Uh, we may have a little looser arrangement, but I think having being part of a crowd is uh, part of the experience. I might just say uh, a word or two, because it's relevant to this, about um, uh, the fact that I went to my first live theater in, in since March. Uh, two nights ago, uh, here in Ithaca, a uh, uh, a very enterprising young man, uh, Sam, Samuel Bugellin is his name. He's he's been associated in New York with the New Ohio Theater, and with the Lark Theater. Uh, he has uh, and and his colleagues have set up a um, uh, an experimental theater called the Cherry Arts Theater here in Ithaca, and this week they opened their, they've been doing Zoom performances and they, this week they did their first live performance. And uh, I could talk more about it later if I, if you wish, but right now I will only say that it was done out of doors. Uh, the characters were masked um, the, and the audience was limited to around 40 people and they were uh, we all set out, we, we were encouraged to bring chairs, so they had some, and we set up our, our chairs in little chalk circles that they called pods that were eight feet apart. Um, and I loved the performance, but still, the audience didn't quite work. It was a comedy, the audience enjoyed it, they laughed, but it wasn't a real audience it was a lot more satisfactory than any zoom production i'd seen for me uh, but there still is uh, uh there still is another part of the dynamic that isn't quite there mm. yeah yeah i know this is definitely a very different experience of of, of the moment of reality and um you know the arts one, i guess one could get used to it but one if one knows about uh, things then that's what we miss uh, once we once we uh, 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 are confronted again with, with that uh, with new new forms or new realities. Yes. Uh, many, many think of you, Marvin, as the foremost historian of theater in the world um, through your work, um, your 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 collection of uh, um, of it real theater experience, but also looking back um, over centuries and also the involvement in European theater, Arab theater, and, um, and, and American theater, of course. Um, is this period we are in, is that, do you think there's anything that can be compared to? Like, is there something where you feel um, this, there are parallels that could be drawn? Well, Frank, I, yeah, I've thought about this. Um, and um uh, of course one can always draw parallels with certain part of the experience but but as a historian i would say within recorded history of the theater there's never been anything like this um the the um uh, uh, i had a colleague uh, email me from india uh a few months ago and said um uh how often in the history of the American theater has has the uh, has the has the, the the New York theater been closed and literally not available? And how does this compare with with uh, 
those times. Well, uh, it's only there's only been a very few times. Um, the the uh, at nine eleven. Uh, the theaters were 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 all closed for a few days, but the Broadway theaters were back open in, in a few days, less than a week. Um, the the um, some off off Broadway theaters never reopened. Uh, again, this partly goes back to to, to commerce. That is, um, people, many people were afraid to go back to the theaters. Obviously, in in the weeks right after 9/11, uh, but the city of New York felt that. It was critical uh, to get the entertainment industry back on its feet, largely because of the of a largely to attract tourists. And so, the city of New York and the state of New York put a lot of money into uh, supporting the theaters, the, the big the Broadway theaters, so they could open in a hurry. And they did open fairly quickly. Um, uh, the the uh, there have been a few other times uh, during a few major major storms, not during the wars. Um, uh, there was an actor strike which closed the theaters, you may remember, um, of 30, 40 years ago. Um, the theaters in Europe or elsewhere in the world have, and, and this is a parallel that would immediately come to mind, I think, have been closed because of the plague. As you know, during Shakespeare's lifetime, the theaters in London were closed several times. Uh, with with the plague, and you would think, well, all right, that's kind of a parallel. Well, it is kind of a parallel, but uh, as I've thought about it, it, it occurs to me that something I talked about earlier, that is people love to have other people act out stories for them. Um, even if it's just a single storyteller, uh, this is almost universal. Uh, uh, but, but a live reenactment or a live telling of some story is something people love to have. And when the theater, when the theaters in Europe were closed during the during the Black Death, the Great Plague, um, theater did not cease to exist. What happened was you went off as people do in the Decameron with a group of your friends off to the country, to, as I am right now in Ithaca, um, where you were out of the city and presumably out of danger. And then you brought in traveling companies like Shakespeare's that were out on, I mean, when the plague was ravaging London, Shakespeare didn't uh, look for other work. He and his company went out and toured around and went to country homes and castles and so on. Uh, like the traveling players in uh, in Hamlet, um, so theater in, in previous plagues, the shutdown has never been total. Um, in, even even when the the uh, in the in the uh, the years after the fall of the Roman Empire, when uh, when all of the theaters. Uh, in Europe, where almost all of them were were closed down, destroyed, the actors dispersed, and so on. What little evidence we have suggests that they didn't all go into some other line of work. They went out. They went out like the traveling players in in Shakespeare's time. And the only theater we have or we know about in Europe for the next several hundred years is precisely that people wandering around in traveling companies from place to place. Um, and that went on during plague years as much as anywhere else. Um, but that's not true now. That is, the, the, we, the, because of the way that the, the dangers and, and the, the, um, uh, the quick spread and easy spread of COVID, uh, nobody has tried and wouldn't try uh, and wouldn't be allowed to do it if they did try to set up traveling companies to sort of go around from town to town. They would be seen rightly as potential spreaders of the, of the virus. So this is new. We've never had a time when the theater, not only in, and of course, the other thing is the global reach of it. Even the Black Plague didn't go everywhere, whereas the, the COVID is Every, every continent uh, is, is under lockdown. So in, in all of those ways, this is different. 
as far as theater is concerned, we've never had anything exactly like this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. It is uh, it's stunning. And uh, as we also learn, mosques are closed for the first time in thousands of years, uh, two thousand years, yes. thousand years. Um, there will be a vaccine. Um, we all know um, nothing lasts forever, ever, whether the good or the bad. Um, so um, there is a big uh, fear that things will go back to normal or how it was, and that wasn't already working or is connected to the problems we have. What were you? What do you think of the current state? Let's see, pre-COVID of New York theater. Was it working? Was it? Uh, is that the best? Uh, the way uh, to organize it. What, what's your evaluation as someone who has really seen so much? What do you think of New York theater? Well, uh, I love any theater. So uh, the, the uh, New York is not my favorite theater. And I think the, there, are, there are many changes I would make in it. Um, the, the amount of talent in New York is astonishing. It's unequaled anywhere, or well, maybe really unequaled anywhere. Uh, the and and by that I mean the really the producing talent, the choreographers in New York, and the choruses are are as good, maybe better than anything in the world. Uh, but and they're certainly competitive with anything in the world. Uh, the the actors, the scenic designers, all of all of those artists. And the playwrights, insofar as they 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 work within a rather restricted boundary, and and then we get into things I don't like as well about the New York theater. Uh, for one thing, um, we are really the only uh, advanced theater culture in the world that is runs its theater entirely on commercial grounds. Well, it's. It's major theater. There are, of course, nonprofit theaters. Though so even nonprofit, the term is kind of a joke in the United States. They're still very uh, economically oriented and economically dependent, whether they want to be or not. And I think no, nobody who is involved would deny this. Um, so uh, theater, theater ought to be state supported the way that art museums are. Uh, that would allow a greater variety of theater, a greater sense of experimentation, and and uh, uh, and a, and uh, the other thing, and, and would connect into the other thing that that bothers me about New York theater, and that is that, not surprisingly, it's it's very conservative, and I don't mean politically conservative, but I just mean. I mean, aesthetically conservative. There are, you don't take major chances very much in the New York theater. Um, uh, and that is, a, again, an economic question. One of the side issues of this, and I'm, I'm not sure how much this is economic and how much it's cultural, uh, and that is that the, the theater, the New York theater is not as, engaged either with with political thought which is the obvious thing but just intellectual thought generally if you want a play that makes you think you go you you're better off going to a british play the british theater makes you think in a way that the american theater tends not to um and that and that's both generally and specifically in terms of uh uh, I, uh, in terms of the 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 the, the particular crises that is uh, uh, over the past uh, decade when we used to have theater, uh, when I would go to Europe, um, to Germany or or to France or to Eastern Europe, um, one one major play, one significant play out of every three dealt with the refugee crisis and immigration. How many major New York plays have dealt with this? Now you might say, well, it's a bigger question in Europe, but it's one of the major questions of our time. Uh, I've seen um, a number of plays, well, really quite a number of plays in Germany or elsewhere in Europe dealing with environmental issues and climate change. 
occasionally in New York, you will get some a play about that, but not in the major theaters. Uh, they, they just are not interested in, in, in these kinds of social and these kinds of social issues, especially if like immigration or climate change, they're politically controversial. Then, then, then the New York theater really won't go near it. Um, so all of those things I find as as a kind of uh, uh, well again I would use the word conservative but not in a political sense. I wish the New York were in a New York theater. It's not it's not the theater's fault nor the producer's fault. It's the fault of the system. Uh, and I think these things may be connected together, but maybe not. And that is that in Europe, in in England, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, um, in in Eastern Europe in general, certainly in Poland and so on. Um, within the culture, the theater is important. The theater is something that a cultured intellectual person is interested in. In the United States, you and I, Frank, are interested in it. But the general, the general public, even in New York, is does not consider the theater an important part of American culture the way a German does. You, having been in both cultures, will know this. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, and. I don't know to what extent that is due to, I don't know what's cause and effect between that and the fact that the US government uh, does not really support the theater. I don't know which comes first, but we are in a culture that uh, historically has not regarded theater as central the way it is regarded in, in, uh, in Germany, for example, or in Poland or, or where. You, you have only, for physical evidence of this, you have only to go, let's say, a town the size of Ithaca, 30,000 people, maybe 50,000 when all the students are here. A theater this, a town this size would have a permanent resident theater in Germany. I mean, well, as you know, well equipped. What do we have? Well, we have... Sam Bugellan, thank God, uh, and, and his little Terry Arch thing. Uh, there are a couple of other community theaters, and they're, it's very nice to have them, but they're, they're, they are just little community theaters. Um, so even, even on the, the most local level, you can see the difference between American theater and, and theater elsewhere. Uh, so that would be my that would be my complaint. It's been a bit of a diatribe, but obviously I feel mm. very strongly about this. No, no, of course it's uh, it's uh, now exposed also that, uh, as you say, that uh, system, that way that's produced, you know, that uh, uh, the form, of course, defines in a way um, the content, the way things are are and then are done. And um, for you, and also if you. Um, uh, you know, compare it, you know, saying you're, it is essential. Why is it essential to you? Why, why do we need theater? What do you think as Marvin? What, what's, what's, why are you interested in it? Ah, well, um, it's a hard question, really. I mean, uh, it's sort of like saying, why do you enjoy listening to music? I mean, I'm a human being. Um, these are things that, 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 hit me on a number of different levels and uh, you know, some very intellectual and some not intellectual at all. Uh, I, I think the most honest answer, why do I keep going to theater is that one time in 40 or 50, there is a moment when theater where I think this is it. This is why I'm a human being. This is what I'm doing in the universe. And it's only once in every 50 or shows or so. But for, for that experience, I would go to 100 shows to get that once. Uh, it's only happened to me maybe a dozen times in my life. Uh, and I think people have found, uh, people who are music lovers have could say the same thing about, uh, I think the arts in general, 
Now, again, you're talking really about, in a way, my religion, I might almost say. Uh, but to give you an honest answer, that's the honest answer. To give you a more uh, rational answer, I would say that uh, uh, I've always been interested in storytelling. And uh, uh, like a lot of people in theater, I came into theater by doing. I started out acting. I loved acting. Uh, uh, I, I don't do much of it anymore, but I, I did play Andrew Jackson off off Broadway about 10 years ago. Uh, it was great. Uh, uh, I love directing. I love the, 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 the idea that you can be a collaborator with Schiller or Shakespeare, uh, and, and, and make that work. For, for for other people and give them a, a kind of experience like that. Um, all, all, of, all of that, uh, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm entertained. I can't think for a, a pleasanter way of passing an evening uh, than to go to a theater where you get all your senses stimulated and your intellect as well, um, uh, where you're, you, where all your emotions are stimulated, uh, it is it, it is one of the most complete, uh, aside from life itself, um, uh, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual experiences you can have packed into a short amount of time. That's what it is for me. It's all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we, as you pointed out, and you are always seeing the access to healthcare, the access to education, and the access to the arts, to theater, is a basic uh, human right. Actually, what uh, you know, people are fighting for in uh, in the streets for everyone. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do you think you spoke about you know the forms that you know don't perhaps don't work? They don't produce that aesthetic results you you love uh, somewhere else even so a lot of i think smaller companies as you know and you are such a big supporter of it in new york make the challenging place but to make the ideas uh, visible it's this thinking by doing you see a brain working um, on stage but the support is just uh, it's heartbreaking to see the conditions and it's uh, mm -hmm. shocking but do you think we need a new political theater in a way do we need something and this is the theme of it now so the political part of us we are in the election year um, do you feel that theater has to re-engage? We accuse politicians that they lost the vote or they are no longer interested. Um, what about theater? Have we, have we also lost sight of, um, you know, the everyday person, the bus driver, the worker, that was for Brecht so important and everybody um, to, to communicate ideas. Um, do, do you think um, um, it has to be a rethinking of it or, is it already happening? Uh, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, 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 the question, Frank. Will the, politi uh, will the political come, come back? Will it, well, um, I, this is a tough question because it, 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 it involves um, what you mean by political. Uh, and so let, let me let me start by um, by taking well what may be a not a not 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 very useful response to your question but one that I think is the most honest answer I can give and uh, through that let me let me uh, let me tell you a story um, the um, some years ago, uh, right after, indeed, the, the process was still going on when the Soviet troops were leaving the, the, uh, the Baltic states, uh, I was with a group of theater people that toured uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, uh, and um, uh, there were still Russian tanks in in the in the the uh, eastern part of. of Two of these countries, um, but they were essentially independent. Um, and what we did, in addition to visiting, uh, going to see theater, obviously we also spoke to theater directors about now that the Soviets are gone, what are you going to do? Um, and uh, uh, I'll never forget a, a particular interchange. This was in Latvia. Uh, 
uh, where at the, the, the National Theater, uh, uh, we, were, we were back in the kind of green room speaking to the director and he said, uh, uh, well, we're thinking about doing Neil Simon. Hmm. Uh, and um, uh, Janelle Renault, who is a very politically oriented uh, theorist and critic who's written a lot about the British political theater um, said, uh, why on earth with your public uh, and your interests would you think about doing a Neil Simon play? And he said, we're tired of doing political theater. We want to do something that's not political. And Janelle, bless her heart, said, you couldn't do anything more political than Neil Simon. So uh, that's by way of saying all theater is political, even doing non-political theater is a political action. So I have to say that to begin with, but that's not really the question you're asking. Uh, the que uh, I, I think, and that is you're really asking questions about in the tradition, because I'm partly because I br already brought this up in the traditional sense of the word, that is what we might call engaged theater. Brechtian theater or or theater like a lot of European theater, whether it's Brechtian or not, that directly raises political questions about the climate or immigration or whatever. Um, should we have more of that? Yes, of course, we should have more of that. I don't think as long as the American theatrical system continues in the way it is, and I think it will after the pandemic. I don't think that will change the theater, the theater's economic or cultural position in any way. I don't think so. I hope that the pandemic will change in, in some very basic ways, some of our political assumptions, our economic assumptions, our assumptions about things like uh, health care, for example. I, I, I hope and I, I really, to an extent, believe that those will change. I don't see any, any reason that theater will, however. And that's partly because um, the American public at large recognizes that the health care system is broken and sees that it is important to fix it. The American public at large does not know whether the, whether the American theater is broken or not and does not care. I mean, at large, that is, uh, uh, there, there really is no feeling that we really ought to have a theater that's more relevant. Um, uh, and, and so you'd have to make a cultural change and the COVID is not in any way um, as it is with healthcare, working to change people's opinions about that. I'm not saying it should, I'm just saying it isn't. And there's no reason you should expect it to. Um, so I guess the, the uh, uh, I think we have, I think there is a, a, a struggle that, that uh, the arts in general and theater in particular have always had in the United States. And, and, and that is to um, encourage the general population to feel that the arts are as important as any other human activity. Um, there is a certain understanding of that on a low level. That is to say, I think everybody feels it's nice if their children have painting classes and, and it, it bring home drawings that they can put on the refrigerator and maybe play a musical instrument that that's that's wonderful um but when they become adults they it, they, that they 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 really tend to then feel well that's great for children and for for leisure time but it's not an essential part of one's life that's obviously that's not true of everybody but it's true of enough people that that we don't have any push for a national theater or, or government supportive theater or whatever. We don't have enough uh, uh, enough push. I mean, nobody, it would be really quite utopian uh, to have 
some group of people in a town the size of Ithaca or even Binghamton or Syracuse to say, we really ought to have a European style theater in this town, a really big theater and an opera house. We really ought to have those as any German town would have. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite uh, quite stunning. Often they seem like, you know, two, 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 two stars, different planets. They communicate in between and shuttles when go back and forth. But um, um, there are um, such, such vast, um, vast differences. Um, well, talking about theater, and you talked about these moments. If I look at your, 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 your 10,000 book, you know, in the 60s, you, you wrote about the living theaters, the connection, Zero Mostel and Bancroft, uh, Peter Brooks Marassad, uh, Brighton Puppets Fire, Hare, Jean-Louis Barreau, Grotowski. In the 70s, it's Ronconi, the Manhattan Project, Nushkin, Charles Ludlam. Foreman, George Strailer, Chaban, the Squad Theater, um, Peter Brooks, Conference of the Bird, the Wooster Group comes then later, the uh, Mabu Mines, it's called Harbor, uh, Thomas Langhoff, the Market Theater, the uh, Yubimov, and then we have Reza Abdu, uh, the Split Bridges, Anna DeWear Smith, Kushner, Tadashi Suzuki, Karen Bayer, Carol Churchill, Julie Tamer. Uh, Paula Vogel in the 2000s, you have Moises Kaufman, Stephen Sondheim, Big Arts, Flickr, Leo Brewer, Stallhouse, Ivo Van Hofer, Castellucci, Remini Protocol, Signa, the Nature Theater of Oklahoma, and the Passion Place. Um, you, you talked about some of those moments, you know, which maybe to share with us uh, some of them so we get an idea of what it inspired you and um, something to to look for, I think you're right, like in sports, how many bad games we watch, how many in between games, but sometimes something for the, happens. For that great, yeah, well, for that great play, you remember yeah. then the rest of your life. Yeah, it's yeah. true. So uh, what are those more? Which ones did you, did you? Well, that's a great question, Frank. And let me, let me however, put it off for a moment because yeah. I, uh, I uh, when I went to, to go back into the into ten thousand nights for just a moment, and then I'll go back to the yeah. question, which, which I I want to do very much. Um, uh, obviously, when I was putting together uh, the the book and decided to choose one play each year, this was a hard, this was the hardest part of the book to say. Okay, what is the one play from this year I'm going to write about? Some some years. It was difficult to think of a single play that was that that important. Other years there were six or eight plays, and I had to had to figure out where I would go with it. Um, the the um, um, uh, the same process has obviously has taken place when I thought of the last ten years, and I want to just indulge myself a moment and tell you uh, what the ten plays are. Oh, good. Yeah, so the people could say, you know. What what kind of things are you thinking about now? Um, I think that uh, uh, in a way, and this was true of the first book, there are certain plays that almost have to be talked about. They are so uh, emblematic of an era or so, um, uh, so, so popular, so much talked about, even if they're unpopular, that they have to be, they have to be one of the, that they have to be the play for that year. And I think only one of the last 10 years has, has that kind of play in it. And that is Hamilton. Hamilton has to be the play for that year. So there are, and I would say very close to Hamilton, uh, not only because of uh, what it represents, or not only because of its popularity, but also of uh, what kind of theater it is and what, it, what, what its influence has been, and that is Sleep No More the first immersive theater. Uh, those two I started with uh, in their particular years. And I'll, I'll just read you the list I have. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, uh, 2011, Sleep No More. 2012, Who Guards the Blood Knob. 2013, uh, Anne Washburn's uh, Mr. Burns, the post-electric uh, post drama. 2014, I remember Mama. They, that, that already was set because I had included that in the... Say again, I think it got cut off. I, I remember Mama. Mama. I had the, that was the epilogue of the first book. 2015, Hamilton. 2016, Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812. 2017, 
game scrug supremacy, and, and that, many people consider that an odd choice, but some of my others were also. Uh, 2018, Jan Fabra's Mount Olympus. 2019, The Jungle at St. Anne's. And 2020 is us playing. Um, so I, I, we, just to give you an idea, I think one thing I might say generally, I didn't think about this until I put it all together, is um, the importance, at least in my theater experience and the way I think about theater, of the rise of immersive theater. Four of these are immersive theater productions, uh, and and uh, others are are, are have a, have an underground relation to, to to that in that they they are examples of what we used to call total theater. There's a kind there's a kind of um, of uh, this is a negative word, but theatrical overkill that's been operating in the last decade. Uh, and I find that really quite fascinating. Now, to get back to your question. Um, yeah, there, there have been, uh, um, there have been several moments, uh, some of them very big and some of them rather small. Uh, and I guess I can say, I know that when they happen because, uh, uh, and this is an experience I'm sure that you have had, I'm sure everyone has had, under different stimuli, and that is, uh, uh, I I find it very close to what um, what T. S. Eliot talks about as the the, the, the religious experience, of what he calls the moment in the rose garden, where there is the moment of he says the intersection of the timeless with time, where time stops, and you are totally into that moment. Um, for me, it's almost literally, people have talked about a chill running down your spine. That is almost literally true. There's a kind of trembling. And it comes into my mind almost in, in, in words, this is it. This is the reason I do this. Um, uh, now, uh, now, to an, to, now to an example or two. Um, certainly one such example uh, was at the end or near the end of Giorgio Strahler's uh, production of King Lear, um, he did this in, in inside a, 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 a circus tent. That is the, the backdrop of the stage was a huge canvas that covered the whole back of the stage. And uh, uh, the main playing area was a, a, a circus um, circle. Uh, with sand in it, and everybody was uh, all the all the characters were in clown type costumes. Very, uh, I mean, it was a very dark clown show, but it was a clown show. Um, at the, uh, all of this went on inside the 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 ring, uh, and various kind of clown routines were used. Um, when Lear comes in with the body of Cordelia. Um, the stage uh, was quiet. There were people on stage, but, but everything was kind of frozen. And the curtain that went, the, the circus tent, we were, so we were all inside this huge tent that covered the entire background. A sword was pushed into the candidates from behind just erupting out and down so that a slice was cut open. And it was as if, it was if the sky was being slid open. Uh, that had been the backdrop all the way through. He slid it through and Lear came through the crack carrying, uh, carrying Cornelia's body. Uh, that moment was such a moment. It, it, it broke open the whole universe somehow. Um, and I suspect many people felt that. Some of the others are a little more personal, but, but not, not really. Um, another moment, much less almost calculatedly non-theatrical that had the same effect to me uh, was uh, 
uh, when Sir Lawrence Olivier was doing Long Day's Journey into Night at the at the, um, at the National Theater of Great Britain, uh, he brought that that show to New York, and there is a moment in the first act, uh, I believe it is, uh, that is normally a kind of throwaway moment, and Olivier made it into such made it into one of these kinds of moments, and. You may or may not remember. There's a conversation he's he is he is having with his son at the uh, at the at the kitchen or dining room table, um, and they've gotten really very very personal, and and revealed things about their hidden lives to each other, which is sort of the whole play uh, that have, they've never talked about before. And in the midst of this, when when when. Uh, They've been talking about. Uh, you remember a, a, an important part of the play is the is the miserliness of um, of of the of the old actor that he's and the reason that his wife is is uh, is addicted to drugs is that he tried to save money uh, when she was ill, take her to a quack doctor who got her onto onto drugs. But and he's he's wasted the family's fortune buying worthless land and so on. So this motif about his miserliness is, is runs through the play. And in the midst of this very emotional scene, he stops his son and says, do uh, you mind if I turn down the light? It's a little too bright in here. Now it's a great symbolic line in, in, about just, they're getting in emotionally too deep, but it also shows he might be able to save a few pennies if he turns out the line. Okay, it's a wonderful line and a wonderful character line. But the way Olivier decided to do this is really quite astonishing. He didn't walk over to the, the wall and turn a switch or pull a, pull a chain from the light to turn it off as is normally done. He climbed up on the table and reached up lick his fingers to unscrew the light. And that's the way he turned it off. However, just as he licked his fingers and started to reach up to unscrew the light, he felt the light hitting him from very close. And suddenly the actor in him came out. And with that light on his face, he turned out to the audience just looked at us and suddenly we saw he had not only turned into Tyrone the actor by the light but he'd also turned into Sir Laurence Olivier this was Laurence Olivier showing us what the theater was and in both of these cases all kinds of echoes go out that you that are hard very hard to articulate because they are i mean they are um visual emotional uh, uh and they're highly symbolic but they're not just symbolic of of uh of mere suffering or olivier's uh miserliness but they are also something about be aware that what you are watching is something the theater does and does it better than anybody else. There is something and you, and I said, this is it. This is why I go. I could give you others, but those are that's two very clear examples. Yeah, yeah, no, they, and they stand for the other ones. And I understand, I mean, in a recent interview, uh, uh, it's an Egyptian magazine, you said, you know, Zoom is not, theater you know you said it's something different and it's right and um, it will once it will be available soon might be an additional way of other things but it's not going mm -hmm. to to um to uh, stay in that sense uh, as a as a, as a form mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marvin, really, really, um, and thank you, you know, for uh, for sharing and um, for for tuning in. And you have, we have all the respect, you know, for for your 
for your work over the decades, the generations of scholars and artists. Paula Vogel was one of your students. Um, many of artists and scholars you have um, produced. Um, and we all know you have uh, students who are already retired and you are still going strong one more year um, and with us and bring all the experience. And uh, this is uh, quite a reminder to say that in the history of theater, the current moment is unparalleled. And um, that is quite uh, something to really think about, um, what it's good for, why we need it, and, uh, and finding ways to um, uh, create that closeness, perhaps an outside these uh, system that will not change, as you, you said, they are engraved and reflect also the morals and values um, of a society. Or um, as Jean-Luc Nancy, he said here on the program, the value of the value. He said, what is the, he, he said of theater, but also of life. You know, you have to see when do we open up or not? What's the value of the value of life? We know it has one, <laughs> and um, these are big, big questions. So this is a, 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 a door you open and a curtain you also now cut open and um, uh, into to the next round of the Siegel Talks where we are um, finding out uh, what needs to be done, what should be done, our idea of creating with all presenters in New York at 2022 festival, but also including the parks, everybody, organizations to do that, do that what you said, immersive experience, including um, uh, audiences and participation. That's not just a, a, a lip statement, but it's really a, a deep engagement as many, many uh, companies are uh, doing that um, already. Um, here at the uh, Siegel Talk for this week, um, Tomorrow we go to Budapest, to Hungary, and we will hear from Andras Forgas, the great Laszlo Upor, and the young student Hanna Milovic of the, the closing of a legendary institution, the Theater and Film School in Budapest, the closing of the current model uh, that government uh, uh, is going to privatize it or already has it, will fire everybody and end uh, 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 an open, as we see it, uh, free and uh, 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 liberal way, the one that you are longing for. Um, so um, it's also quite a, uh, an ask for help, for support for, for our colleagues in Hungary, the country as we know, uh, is moving in a direction that I think is dangerous and is also a question the values, you know, of, um, of the enlightenment and of the, the ideas, the very basic ideas um, of a democracy. And Friday we go back um, to our friends from Lebanon, Sahar uh, Asaf and Dima Mata, right after that big explosion, um, uh, we thought to talk to them also together with Halron, and they said it was too close, they couldn't really, but now we get an update from uh, both of them, and also to see if there's a way that perhaps New York theater, with all the complications we have here, uh, Beirut is worse, and what is happening there is shocking, and, um, and if there is a way to to, 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 to show our um, solidarity. And then going on, we will talk to New York producers and uh, people who run the parks, uh, or communities who do already great work in the park. So much already is happening, nobody needs us, but perhaps we can combine and then also in the creation of a festival. Someone said on the Siegel Talks that uh, uh, the uh, Avignon Festival, the great festival, perhaps the greatest in the world at the moment, you know, was created after World War II. I think there should be a great festival celebrating life uh, in the city of New York, an artist's contribution. Uh, we have to really work for that. And uh, Morgan Janess said, if Joe Pop would be alive, he would do work in the parks. He would engage people, he would show work there. He was the one who said, when I was a young kid coming from Poland, my mom sent me to the library and I got a Shakespeare book for free. If I had to pay for it, I never would have gotten the book out. And then he said, Shakespeare should be free or the theater should be free. That was his basic idea and I think, we have to go back in our steps and, and reinvent and I invite everybody to participate. So Marvin, thank you really for um, being with us. I want everybody also about your, your book, uh, the, the short history of theater, a small book. There's an overview on global theater, how uh, also theater in, in Asia, uh, Europe, uh, in Africa, there's quite a, I think a brilliant uh, 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 a collection of, uh, uh, um, of thoughts and uh, uh, hints and, uh, and uh, reflections on the incredible kaleidoscope uh, of theater and performance, thousand year old traditions and uh, new developing forms. So uh, Marvin, thank you. And uh, uh, I hope we didn't hold you back too much from your lunch. Uh, say hi to Pat and uh, we hope to see you whenever we see you when CUNY is opened again, our building is closed. It's incredibly hard to get in. It's, uh, 
quite a devastating time for everybody, also for students. Um, but I hope uh, that um, also our talks will help to 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 create some meaning and to find uh, find find some solutions. Thank you all, really, really, for listening. Mm -hmm. Um, to us audience members, um, I know there's so much and much, much more in the fall than we started. We started right away in March, um, over four months with daily programming and um, and HowlRound for hosting at Andy Lerner at the Siegel Center and uh, all the best. I hope to see you again soon. Stay safe and stay tuned and really thank you all for participating. It means uh, the world to us. Thank you.